Welcome everyone to our June meeting of the Animal Care Centers of New York Board. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, welcome board members. We have two, two board members we're still hoping can join us. Uh, and we have two that couldn't join us today. We're a board of a total of 13 and we're complete as of midnight last night. So very excited about that. Uh, we are the board of Animal Care Centers of New York. We have 13 members. Three of us are ex officio uh, officers, uh, city government representatives who serve on the board as part of their service and work with the city of New York. We're, we have representatives from the Department of Health, from the Parks Department and the Police Department. And then 10 of us are volunteers and of those ten, seven of us are appointed by the mayor's office, by the mayor, and three of us are board appointees. Uh, so the board, uh, we have a nominating committee within our board that uh, creates a pool of candidates that serves both the, the mayor's appointees and the board appointees. And this morning, I'm really happy to welcome our two newest board members, one of whom is a mayoral appointee, Alea Simpson, and the other, Suri Miranda Alarcon, is our newest board appointee as of this morning. So welcome both of you. I, I'm going to have a little chat with each of you just so we can get to know you better. Um, and I just want to quickly give you an outline of today's meeting. We'll do some board business at the start. We will uh, review the financials for fiscal year 24 and we will hear a presentation and vote on FY25's budget. We'll hear from our CEO, Risa Weinstock, on what's going on in the shelters. And we will hear from Alex Silver from the mayor's office on the city managed capital projects. And then finally, at the end of the meeting, which is something we do at each meeting, it's important for us as board members to hear from the members of the public who want to speak to us, ask questions, give comments. Uh, we will have the public comment session. Each speaker, it's important that you limit your comments or questions to two minutes, and we will be timing it, and I will be enforcing it, because we can't go over our time this morning. And also, I'm reminding everyone who is signing up to speak that we expect you to be civil, polite, and respectful. There's a way of bringing your concerns and questions to us without attacking or maligning or, or, or using uh, language that is just unacceptable. So if that happens, we'll just end the whole session so you'll ruin it for all of us. Um, and. I also just wanted to, to acknowledge we have a lot of the staff from ACC here today, and to all of you, and to all of you who are in the shelters working, the board is so appreciative and, and thanking you. This is a particularly challenging, very hot time to be on the front lines uh, serving uh, the people and the animals of New York, and, and we appreciate it greatly. It's, it's, uh, it's work that is difficult in the easiest of days, but, but in the middle of summer in this heat. Uh, so we were thinking of you and acknowledge you and thank you. So Leia, we are very happy to have you here joining us. You were appointed back in January just after we met uh, by, by the mayor and we're very excited to have you here. Uh, you're a familiar face to almost everybody who's been with ACC for a while, so that's exciting. And you're currently the program manager of the Humane Society of U.S. Uh, Pets for Life program. Can you uh, just tell us a little bit about that work since it, it's certainly adjacent to, to all the things we think about here? Try to hold this down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. Um, so right now I'm one of the program managers, one of the national program managers for our Pets for Life program with the Humane Society of the United States. And our program primarily focuses on providing access to resources and bridging the gap between resources for people and pets in underserved communities. 
and we go into sh um, shelters and different animal welfare organizations and even some human-based organizations throughout the 50 states and try and uh, work and coach and mentor organizations who want to create those programs. So, um, but a lot of that work, I couldn't be there without actually working at ACC. I was with, uh, work with the organization for six years um, and the founding manager of the admissions department, which has grown um, tenfold since I've been there. I'm so excited to see the amazing work that they're doing. So I'm glad to come back and contribute to um, the shelter and the people and pets of New York. Yeah, it's really great to have you here and to have a, a, a veteran of ACC uh, joining the board from someone who's been on those front lines I was just talking about is, is really amazing for us. I think all of us on the board are excited to have you here and to have your perspective and to uh, to lead us as we go forward. So thank you so much. It's great to have you. And I understand you also have at least two cats at home, right? Two cats, yes. Yes, I have yeah. two cats. Um, our oldest one is 14, her name's Clover, and our newest addition is a two-year-old cat named Simona. Both came to us through the cat universe cat distribution system, so they like stumbled into our home, but they're um, super sweet. Awesome, that's great. Suri, welcome. It's so good to have you here. Uh, it's been great getting to know you over these last few months, and you currently are the Director of Campus and Community Engagement at Fordham University, and you have many, many years of service working in the Bronx communities in, in specific, which is a place that we're all very eagerly anticipating being part of that community soon. We have uh, broken ground, we have uh, some concrete poured, and someday we will uh, we'll hear from Alex uh, a timeline today, but we'll be opening a state-of-the-art shelter in the Bronx. So it's, it's, a, it's a great time to welcome you to the board and to have that kind of experience joining us is really exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background working, working particularly in the Bronx communities? Hello. Can, okay, perfect. Good morning, everyone, again. Um, so yes, my name is Suri Miranda. I'm the Director of Campus and Community Engagement with Fordham University, but I had a long tenure working with the city um, in different departments. I started with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs back in the days with IDNYC. And actually, it's a great memory that I have because I used to do outreach and partnership with the ACC specifically to get people to sign for the IDNYC because That's they right, were adopting right. pets. Um, um, and specifically to me um, this is a great opportunity and appreciate um, the trust and um, one of the things that I want to want to make sure um, I'm a proud Bronx side but it's specifically something that I specialize is um, access of opportunity access to information and a lot of times people don't necessarily know of the resources that are available um, and I want to make sure that whether it is um, because of linguistical um, challenges or also um, structural, um, specifically for the Bronx, like going from point A to point B is not as easy. So I want to make sure that we're um, giving, um, going the extra mile to make sure that people are informed of the resources that we have available. That's awesome. And, and again, I think as we, we as an organization continue to layer in uh, community service and outreach and food banks and clinics and, and ways of helping people stay with the pets they love here in the city, I think it'll be really fantastic for us to have your thought leadership around engaging communities that are often underserved in the city as we uh, work hard to end homelessness of animal, animals here in the city. Um, and, I, and I know uh, when we were chatting over these few months, you've had a lot of background with having animals important important animals in your life and not to go into any long stories but uh but could you just let the board know a little bit about uh how they have been in your life throughout your life so actually sorry i grew up on a dairy farm so animals are a big thing for me um, so specifically moving to New York was um, one of the things that I missed the most is specifically being surrounded by pets by living animals. Um, and I think that that was the first thing that um, adopting a pet was what made me feel like home, like that New York City became my home um, once I was able. Frida is back home. She's not a happy camper because of the um, heat wave. Um, but right now, um, Frida is my little baby. So great to have both of you here. Uh, 
and it was really nice getting a chance to have a little chat with you. Um, we need to approve our board minutes. We we have a set from January and a set which I believe is in our inboxes from our very brief meeting we had uh, at the um, Manhattan shelter a couple months ago. So may I have a uh, motion to approve those minutes? Moved. And a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Our minutes are approved. And I think from now we're good when we uh, focus in on, in particular, the Queen's project, we'll, we'll hear from Christine about the Queen's Committee uh, and their work, but I think we can move on right now to our financials. So over, over to Jeff. Yes. Does this work? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, so just as a note to those that haven't um, been, aren't that familiar with our financials, we are a June 30 year-end. Um, so we are still a couple of weeks away, but a short number of weeks away from actually closing out the year. Um, so what we have today to talk about is year-to-date May. The hope is that we'll have June closed out probably about three, four weeks from now so we can roll into our, our audit work. So what you are about to see, if I do this correctly, and I did, is a, um, a summary of the statement of activities for the 11 months ended in May. Everything is on the same basis. What that means is that while the actuals are 11 months, that budget column that you see is essentially, think of it as 11 twelfths of the annual budget. This way, it was try we're trying to get to apples to apples in that comparison. And that prior year columns, which are to the right, that prior year is the 11 months ended May of 23. So as close to apples to apples as we can get. The, um, the financials, when you look at um, the, the audited final year end, you're going to see that there are basically two activities that go on within the ACC financials. One is the day-to-day -day shelter operations, and the other is all of the work around the uh, construction of the facility. When we talk about budget, we are only talking about that the shelter operation. So we aren't referring to what's happening with the uh, the 1906 uh, flushing work. So just understand that. Um, so for the 11 months ended May, ACC increased its total net assets by a little over two million, of which 1.5 is the increase in unrestricted net assets, and the other 500,000 is restricted or 1906 flushing. Um, it is 1.5, um, which is good. The budget was zero. Um, some of what's happening there is we do have some um, costs of the shelter operation, both internal as well as um, capital. Uh, that is being capitalized as part of that construction project, so that, that's helping a little bit. One of the numbers that looks funny, and I probably should have footnoted it, but I'll just get it out of the way in case anybody is wondering. Um, we have um, an in-kind contribution. You see that line of 1.445? In April, we found out uh, the amount of the um, in-kind uh, pension contribution. And so since that was in April, it was just recorded in the ledger in April. And so what it does, makes it look funny, is that the personnel services appears to be higher than budget by some number. That's because of that million for in-kind. Probably should have admitted it for this because I didn't want you to get the wrong impression. So I'm just going to bring that out now. Um, in general, our expenses are in line with our revenues. They are directional, given that most of the funding is on a DOH reimbursement basis. So it's based on uh, budgets and budgets being approved and expenses being uh, claimed and, and then approved by DOH. So it's in the same direction. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more when we get maybe three slides later about um, development work. But I'll point out now that the lines for shelter revenue, giving, and event revenue, which combined we'll just call development, just to give me a word for it. Um, year to date in May, that's come in at about 3.2 million on a gap reporting basis, which is behind uh, where we anticipated in the budget by a couple hundred thousand. Um, it's about even maybe a little bit behind prior year, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, again in a future slide. Any questions on what you're looking at? Okay, something comes up, you can interrupt me later. 
This is the balance sheet as of May. I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that there are two different things when you see a, uh, a balance sheet of the operate, uh, of, of ACC. <laughs> Essentially, the shelter operation is one, and then the construction is the second. And that's why you see a breakout between ACC and this 1906 flushing. But that's what the balance sheet looks like together. So that's what's on the left. And what's on the right is a comparison of what that balance sheet looks like consolidated as of now, which is May 31, 24. And the next column is how we started the year, how we ended last year, which is June 30 of 23. So you'll see our total net assets have gone up by about $5 million. Liabilities have gone up three. Again, net assets went up by two million, is what was presented on the, the previous slide. Uh, so the cash on hand is about five million at the end of, uh, of May. Um, again, net assets with temporary restrictions are about two million, so unrestricted cash available, it's about three. Uh, there are um, ARs that are still out there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit when we get to the cash flow slide about um, the advances and what's a little bit different about this year compared to prior year. Uh, but the AR, less the outstanding advances, at the moment is about a million four as of May. Uh, we have a couple of months that um, are still waiting approval and, and reimbursement from, from DOA. But that's a pretty clean balance sheet. I'll also mention, I've mentioned this before, uh, we do have a, a portfolio of uh, donated uh, marketable securities. Uh, they continue, we continue to collect securities donations and that portfolio has actually appreciated in value over time. Uh, none of the securities have been sold to date. Um, for those who are curious, the total basis of the donated securities is about 273,000 and the portfolio has appreciated by 228,000. So that's about 501,000 altogether, but that's what it's worth. It. And then I'll also mention, just for the record, we do have access to a line of credit. Uh, we haven't needed to draw upon it, so that's good news, but it's nice to know that we have it if needed. Any questions on the balance sheet? Great. The next slide is the cash flow summary, which essentially is just the bridge. You know, what has changed balance sheet beginning of the year and balance sheet now? Um, and the, uh, the main the main item to take away, the cash from operating activities is a positive number. It's gone up by about 2.8 million or so. Uh, 1906 flushing has gone up. Uh, we've spent about a million two in capex this year, which is a bit heavy, but it's heavy because we are investing in the, uh, the Queens facility and now the build up of that. So that's what's happening. But again, net cash flow is a, is a positive number. Um, I've mentioned the advances before. Um, so normally, uh, there is an advance that's provided in July, about 15% of the annual budget, which we did receive. Um, this year, we received a supplemental advance, um, 10%, uh, or two months, I think, whatever it was. I don't think it was another 10%. Um, there was a migration in billing platform from HHS Accelerator to Passport citywide. And so in support of that migration, there was an advance uh, given uh, just to basically make sure the organizations weren't hurt by the, um, the, the logistics of, of moving to the new platform. Uh, so uh, there are advances, obviously, that are being recouped. Uh, but, but again, the city took care of us, and we've been able to, uh, to fund the operation as well. But that's why the advances are so large. Any questions on the, uh, the cash flow? Super, okay, great. So the next slide is the, um, the development update. Um, what you're looking at here, and I'm gonna hand it off to Teresa, but um, this is, again, the development area. So this would not be, this would not include the DOH. It's the, basically, it's non-DOH uh, revenue sources. That's what you're looking at. You wanna take the one? So I will start off just generally talking about the development department. Um, we were not fully staffed this year, and um, uh, Jen, as you know, had baby, which was great, so she was on maternity leave, and the team of Michelle and Nicole, and with Sandra and I paying a lot of attention to development, sort of pulled it together. Um, Michelle and Nicole did a great job, and then Jen came back part-time. So. We weren't as robust in terms of staffing. Um, but the other uh, focus 
that we usually have with respect to events and cultivation and um, sort of what's the message for ACC. We sort of slowed it down a little bit because of the, um, some of the, not delays, but just the time it's taking to get the new capital projects to a place where we could market them and actually get a lot of interest from. We're sort of at the same place. You'll hear in the Queen's report, we're not at the same place there anymore, but at the time during the um, several months of her, um, uh, the last you know eight months, it, we didn't really have anything to sort of put out there as like, this is so exciting. However, that said, um, in individual giving, we did really well. Um, most of individual giving that we um, uh, sort of saw an uptick of online donations. We do these email appeals, plus you know people just come to the site online and donate. Uh, and major gifts also went up. Major gifts is what we consider a thousand dollars or more. We did have um, I think two stock donations this year and direct mail, we do four a year. The last one was sent out June 10th, and so we're waiting to see those results. So with individual giving, we did better than budget, and we did better than last year, um, and so we're really pleased to see that. Moving forward, in terms of like the next, when we look for a development director, there'll be a lot of emphasis on individual giving. We see a lot of strength there, and how do we build that out with a big message about the new um, shelters coming. And I think that we could, uh, I, I think that that's actually untapped, even though we've done better than budget and then uh, last year's actuals. I think there's tremendous potential there. So the person who we're looking for will have a, a strong, that's what we're looking for, a strong um, experience in individual giving. On the institutional side, also, we're doing, we're doing strong um, we have a few additional um, new institutional givers. Really important to keep growing that uh, base because you know some of the institutions give every other year. Um, they give a little less than each year, but still really important. And again, with the new capital projects, our goal is to cultivate um, corporations who are interested in us as an organization first to get to know us, to come see us. Queens we see as a really great marketing opportunity and then grow um, our involvement there. Um, event income, obviously STEM, we did not have the spring flame. That was due to staffing, due to timing, due to everything else that's going on um, at ACC. We really thought we could use a spring flame event to talk about all the new developments, but the, the, the amount of work that's going into the capital projects is, is so time consuming that we really didn't have um, the bandwidth to have another event. That again, the person who comes in, that's part of the strategy for fiscal 25 in terms of what um, we want to uh, continue and grow in development. And then bequest is really hard to sort of put a number on what we think the right budget is. Um, it's that we so far have thirty-five thousand dollars in bequests. We thought we might get to fifty, but again, it's such an unknown number. And as you see, last year in fiscal twenty-three, we had two hundred seventy-eight, and there was a, I think it was a two hundred fifty thousand um, dollar bequest that we had received. Uh, one of the things about bequests that's super important <coughs> to us is that. Um, that 35,000, again, just like last year, represents people who we were unaware of, who put us in their wills, and that always is so so sad to all of us because, you know, somebody clearly was thinking about ACC, and in their lifetime, I think it could be a really meaningful um, experience for them or conversation. So we have our legacy campaign. We have about 35 commitments to um, um, of people who said they will put us in their will. And we'll, we'll continue to push that and try and, um, through the names that we're getting through this legacy um, program, try and cultivate those um, relationships. And actually, a lot of them are coming from the campaign, people who really love our work and say, I really want this to be a lifetime um, investment on my part, and I, I'm going to put you in my will. So um, you know, I think the more that we bring people in to see what we're doing, uh, the more relationships that we can build off of that. Uh, what else? Um, on, the on the receivables, do you want to talk a little bit about that? 
for fiscal 24? Sure. Um, we have one of the receivables is the city council funds. Um, that works on a reimbursement basis. So at the end of the fiscal year, we submit vouchers and <coughs> we receive the reimbursement within the first quarter of the following fiscal year. So that's a receivable. And in addition to that, we have the Milstein. We also received news this week that we would get $75,000 from another foundation, the Community Trust. And um, we also received stock, $30,000 <coughs> in stock this week. So those are receivables that would be added to the year-to-day revenue. And we'll get us closer to the fiscal 24 goal. Any questions? Yes. <coughs> the door of licensing, uh, is that a... Oh, on the next slide. No, no, it's on this slide. On this <coughs> is, that, is that considered uh, new development? No, but it's revenue. That, isn't that a line of donations? Isn't that what that is? That's donations. That's the donation like portion? When I, oh, yeah. when when I Renew my license. Yes, you always donation. bump it up a few thousand. Oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> so, so the revenue from licensing the laws, how, how big is that? Who gets that? Well, if this line is the, you're saying, Jeff, this is the donation portion. What you're looking at is the part where, like Patrick, do you want to, yeah. right? The licensing part, I mean, a license costs $8.25, I think, if your dog is, um, dog. The, is the fee to license your dog, is that what you're talking about? Which is about, yeah. it, goes, it goes into the city's general fund. Okay. Anything else on revenue? Okay, so we are going to move on to Fiscal 25. Um, the fiscal 24 budget you see on the screen is a combination of DOH and non-DOH funding. Um, yes. Yeah, we, have, we have a logistical snafu of some sort. I'm looking at my slide, and my slide has a well, it starts with revenue, and the next thing is DOH MH revenue. I guess when this thing got turned into this. It cut that off, so we apologize for the top row missing. So the first row should be the DOH revenue that was approved. And I want to say it was intentional, so it's a surprise. <laughs> the DOH revenue for fiscal 25 is um, $29.4 million for operating expenses and the $4.5 million you see there. The $4.5 million you see there is for mortgage payments. In addition to that, we projected $4 million in non-deal wage revenue, and that includes all the individual institutional and events revenue, um, also bequests. Um, and the city council money, the dog licensing, and shelter income fees. Um, between both funds, we are projecting, we have a budget for fiscal 25 of $38 million, and of which 24 million is going to be allocated for salary and fringe um, expenses. <coughs> the remaining funds are all for operating costs, and um, you'll see that the more significant, significant increases is in the rent and utilities line, the facilities, and the client slash animal supplies um, line. And this is all directly related to the opening of Queens, the new Queens Care Center. Question. In fiscal 2024, that hasn't been completed yet. Correct. The fiscal 24 numbers are to date uh, through my, I'm sorry, May 31st this year. So we still have a month of expenses very robust through a lot of Queens expenses happen throughout June so this number will definitely increase by the end of the fiscal year. So when you're comparing fiscal 25 to 24, are you comparing the same time 
Um, I'm going off by the actual expenses today through May 31st and adding the projected expenses for fiscal 25. So, so it's a projection for the complete year? Correct, yes. Oh, okay. Although one month is okay. But it's in there as a whole. I just want to make sure it's apples to apples. It's Any other questions? Thank you. Well, actually, I do. How does it, because that one line is missing. You said it was from the DOH, which was 29.4 million. How does that fit? Is that set the budget for the end of the act? How does that compare? Um, that's part of the 30, 38 million dollars. So if you see the total revenue anticipated for fiscal 25 is 38 million, and we are anticipating to use the $38 million as well in expenses. So everything is going to um, be used for operating expenses. She's asking how it compares. So yeah. that's against FY 2024. So it's a significant increase. Yeah. Right. 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 So in fiscal 24, we received nine, the budget was 29 million dollars, and in fiscal 25, it will be 10 million dollars more. So the budget is 10 million dollars. Yes. Correct. And why is it high? Queens, definitely Queens related expenses. Yes. So at this point, we should vote on and approve our budget, something we haven't been able to do at this meeting for the last couple of years. Uh, but it's, a, it's great to be able to do it. So may I have a motion to approve our FY25 budget? Thank you. And a second? All in favor? Aye. Our budget is approved by the board. Okay, Risa. I'm going to introduce Alex Silver, who will give us an update on the city's capital projects. I'm not a morning person, so forgive my in advance lack of time. Oh. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Alex Silver, director of the mayor. Office of Animal Welfare. It's really great to see you all here. Uh, great to see the turnout, people who came and are interested in ACC. Um, I'm really going to give a brief uh, overview of the city uh, managed capital projects, which is basically everything going on except for Queens, which we saw, I'm sure we'll touch on. Uh, but before I do, I just want to say, first of all, Welcome to the new board members. It's wonderful to see you here. Um, Aliyah, I've had the pleasure of knowing you and through our work at ACC and I remember uh, learning all about, I was in communications and, and, and we did an interview I think about the admissions and surrender prevention program and I was just blown away by all the work you were doing and how progressive it was. I think it was 2014 when we were doing that um, and really you know setting the stage nationally and it was very very cool to learn from you and it's wonderful to see you on the board now and at HSUSA. <laughs> Great to see you. And um, sorry, it is wonderful to see you again. And thank you for reminding that we met at one of those clinics doing the outreach. And um, it is just wonderful that you're on the board. I'm excited for your experience and to work together. I love that you um, have that experience in the city and connecting, and I'm hoping we can work together too. And to everyone on the board again, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for all you're doing. Uh, I also want to echo what Patrick said about the staff and volunteers at ACC. It's been, as he said, a particularly challenging time, not just in New York, 
but across the country, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, in New York here we're seeing this dog population. Um, this is not a challenge that unfortunately is unique to New York, it's happening everywhere, but our staff and volunteers at ACC are really doing incredible work and um, just echoing Patrick's appreciation for them and recognition. All right, so with that, uh, I will just go through the capital uh, projects. Uh, we have the Manhattan Adoption Center, first up, with some new pictures. I always love when we have new pictures. Um, we've seen the outside, but now I think these, I'm pretty sure these are new pictures of the inside that you can see. Construction is complete, and we are just awaiting final inspections, so very exciting. Uh, we anticipate opening this summer. Um, and hope to have more updates soon, but um, looking really good there. The Bronx Animal Care Center, um, also new pictures with this concrete that we can actually see. So I think the last time I was here in January, we were talking about a lot of the underground work that was happening. There's a lot that has to go on before you even start building. Now we can see it. Uh, so uh, the structural steel is being fabricated. It's gonna be delivered. Um, supposed to be delivered next month. They're gonna install a sidewalk shed. Uh, construction substantial completion is expected next summer, 2025, uh, with opening to the public expected fall 2025. Um, as we've learned, construction dates tend to change sometime, but this is what we're hoping for and anticipating, and it's moving along, so it's very exciting to see that. <laughs> Um, just to remind everyone what we're going towards, these are pictures of what it's going to be, and it's going to be beautiful, so very exciting. Brooklyn, also going to be wonderful. This is another rendition of what it's going to look like. Uh, the groundbreaking is projected for this summer, 2024. I know ACC is doing a lot of prep work in the city um, to, to get that going. Uh, anticipated construction, uh, substantial completion of construction is for summer 2026 with a move-in projected the following fall. Um, and I know we're going to, this is tied in with the Queens project, so this will be starting very soon. And again, just a couple more pictures of what it's going to be like. These are really 21st century animal shelters that New York City deserves, that our animals deserve, that our people, staff, volunteers, and anyone visiting to adopt and um, learn about animals deserve. So it's very exciting that we're going to have these state-of-the-art facilities. And that is it. If anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Try to answer them. Would there, would there be any possibility there's an empty building at the Manhattan shelter, there's an empty building that the city could acquire that because it's contiguous with the parking lot? It's the one that's west of the shelter now. That's not the garage, that's, that's garage. becoming. Is that the lot that's been empty forever or is that something no, else? Not. I'll have to look into that. I don't because you're not talking about the pet adoption center. No, no, but, it's, yeah. it's not that one. Sir. The one next that's been there, and I, I think it's for sale, or they're thinking about putting up for sale. I'd be happy to hear more about it. I, I'm not familiar with it. I was thinking of the lot that I used to pass when I was going to Manhattan shelter all the time, being like, oh, maybe we could build on that space, but I, something different that you're referring to. So I'm happy to hear more information and speak with the city. I don't know if any of if the city representatives want to know about that or but I'm happy to learn more. We can look into it together, Alex. Thanks. Thank you. I... Okay, so... Before I um, talk about what's happening at ACC, on the inside. I just want to um, add to Alex's comments. Um, there's a lot of um, attention to these new buildings that I think is worth noting. Uh, the Staten Island Care Center, which opened a couple of years ago, is you know full-fledged operations. It continues to get design awards, and I think right now it's collected three, which is really terrific. And we do a little you know, a public thing, and then the people, the architect, um, and some of the designers who go to collect the award, they talk about ACC. So it's sort of like another way of getting our name out there. Um, and in Manhattan, I actually just got an email, apropos of really not, not the board meeting, um, from the architect in Manhattan who told me that um, that building just received another award. She's very active 
in the architectural community and um, has won, she won one award for design and now that it's completed, she, she entered another um, architectural review uh, award ceremony thing and she just won another award. And so we expect to broadcast that and you know showcase it in each of the care centers. So again, another way to get out who ACC is, what we're doing, what it looks like. And then I also just want to say in terms of um, ACC success in these buildings and people who work here, people who are on the board, I think the only way we can really be successful is for the community to understand and know who we are. So having Aaliyah join, having Alec, like former ACC employees, like they know us, they know what we do, they know what we're capable of. Having Suri join, you've been to our clinics, you know who we are. Like I feel like all of you who have been on the board for several years and longer, you understand us. And you know, we use these board meetings, they're open to the public. We want more people to talk about us, to see us, to hear us, and to know us. We're not just adoptions. We're not just, oh, they take in all the like I feel like we've built our reputation for so many years based on the good work we do, but we really can't go beyond that without people talking about us and, and sharing the message. And um, when we talk about Queens, and I'll go down. Um, Queens is built with the expectation to be a community center, to be a focal point in not just Ridgewood, Queens, but it is on the border of Bushwick. And it's a really vibrant community. A lot of people who have mixed breed dogs that we can see because there's lots of cafes and you can sit outside and just hang out outside and people walk by. And we always, of course, we're animal people, we always say, oh, you're, oh, your dog's so cute. And we start up a conversation and then they find out that we're the ones behind the care center going up and they talk about we want to volunteer. And so there's so much potential there, even for people who already have pets. Um, someone had made a suggestion with all this like beautiful space for community that we should just have Saturday morning yoga for people before we open, have them come in, and then when we open, like, you know, roll up your yoga mat and walk around and take a look and see who we are and tell people how great the space is. And so I'm really excited for this next level of what these new buildings can do for us. Yes, they are built for um, elevating animal welfare. They're built to elevate um, human welfare. They're meant for our staff to have a really good place to work. And um, you can see from these photos how much um, light has been emphasized. Um, the top <laughs> left is the front of the building. Uh, it, since our last board meeting, City Council passed um, a, a bill or, you know, sort of enacted that the care center in Queens will be called the Paul A. Malone Animal Queens Animal Care Center. And um, that's just a mock-up, but that's what it will look like. We'll have signage there, and then to the left, we'll have the ACC logo. And I think, again, Paul Vallone was such a loved um, council member. His, his reach in the community was really broad. Um, we've been talking to the family. Katie's been talking to his wife. They, they are so lovely, and I think that they have a really big group of people behind them. And so just by having Paul's name on the building, I think is really going to be um, very very good for, for us and for the community. Um, to the top right, with all that space, there's a lot of um, thought behind uh, noise control. So those are like buffers in the main uh, area. When you walk up the steps, it's very open where the staff um, lunch uh, area where they have, uh, where they can eat, it's very open. And that was intentional. So that those are just pictures of color and light. Um, when you go clockwise down below, that is the, I just wanted to show some of the new equipment, that's dentistry, that bottom right um, piece of equipment. We have never done that before. We see a lot of owner surrenders coming in because of dentistry, and that can be expensive. That will be an important part of the clinic when the clinic does open. 
And then the center picture is, again, just the big open area when you get to the second floor where all cat adoptions will be. And then we have this beautiful staircase from the first floor to the second floor with a picture of one of our very own thoroughbreds right up on that whole wall. And then to the left of that is radiology. And it's really great to have a room that wasn't sort of a dark afterthought with a thick door on it. Like this is, it's such a beautiful place. You, if you didn't know it was an animal shelter, you would think it's like a, a state-of-the-art um, hospital. It's clean, it's bright. Um, and this radiology room will be shared between the public clinic and um, shelter operations. So we're really excited about the work, what it looks like. Um, you know, we were really excited to, we thought we would be moving animals in um, two weeks ago in June, but like every construction project, um, the closer you get, the more you see you have to address. You know, it looks like uh, visually on the outside, oh my gosh, when are you moving in? But, um, you know, we're in that final stretch. It's a little bit more than just punch list items. We will be in there while the contractor is still doing punch lists, which is a small, um, you know, fixes. The things that we're looking at are the, the um, parking area on the second floor that leads into the garage and, you know, for our trucks to have access there. That has to be paved. Uh, the roof has, you know, we've had torrential rain. So the roof has shown some, uh, uh, what, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, you know, the roof has shown some issues. But frankly, I'm glad that it happened before we moved in because that's not, that's not what you want to see. So there's a lot of attention on um, where the leaks are coming from and trying to shore that up before we move in. That for us was a, a, a deal breaker. We were not going to move in until that was complete. And the contractor has been working on weekends to get um, get that done. And then we're working on Wi-Fi and internet and all of that to make sure that that's locked down. So, you know, I'm not gonna give a date, but we're really hopeful. <laughs> I mean, Alex said the summer is, um, the big construction start is late summer for Brooklyn. And that's, you know, our, our expectation is late summer. We will be moving all our animals into Queens. And um, we don't need to talk about it now, but just in your, like, again, we are only successful because of the community around us. Important to shout out the ASPCA once again, who will help us with that caravan of animals in Brooklyn. We have, you know, over 200 animals that have to come to Queens, and that's that's more than ACC alone could do. And so, um, the level of support that we're getting from the community and from the A and from other animal welfare organizations in the city has been great. And um, everybody's been very, very willing to be flexible with um, a, a moving date that just gets being pushed a little bit, but I'm grateful that they're patient. Part of Queens uh, also involves what's going on on the outside. And like I said, building community and having people understand who we are and seeing the potential, it's really important to lay those seeds now. And so board member Christine Kim and um, Paul Sanders, who I'll invite up here, who is our senior administrator of community affairs um, and government outreach, have been working together with, there's a Queens outreach committee of the board um, doing a lot of work and I will turn it over to them. Hello everyone. Um, so I'll just give a brief update on what the Queens Committee has been up to. Um, I think a small group of us on the board plus some ACC leadership have been meeting uh, for about six or seven months now to talk about the strategy and implementation of outreach for the Queens Care Center. Um, and so our strategy really revolves around this stakeholder group list that we've developed. And I'm not going to read out every single stakeholder that we've identified, but just to name a few. You know, there's some obvious ones like the community boards in Queens, um, elected officials in Queens, advocacy groups, schools, libraries, etc. Uh, but it also includes on here are small businesses, corporations, arts and culture organizations, community-based organizations. Um, so each of our Queens committee members has sort of assigned ourselves to different stakeholder groups and what has evolved over the last six or seven months that we've been working on implementation is that, you know, 
the timeline is sort of um, is evolving um, with our outreach strategy, and a lot of it is sort of contingent on when the shelter opens, um, but also we've realized that there are certain groups that we just need to prioritize. So when we first started developing our outreach strategy, I think we, especially me, I was really excited and went to hit the ground running. I was like, outreach, outreach starts now for everyone. Um, but, you know, there are certain groups that we just absolutely must reach out to before the Queen Center opens, and those are our community boards and our elected officials. Um, so Paul and I have been having regular communications with all of the elected officials and the community boards that make the most sense at this moment. Um, so we've, I mean, Paul keeps in regular communication with all of the elected officials anyway by reaching out to them through newsletters um, to keep them abreast of just all things that are going on with ACC. Um, but the elected officials have also received a personalized outreach from me with Paul copied. Um, so that was everyone on city council who has been, who is a Queens elected, um, all of our state senators, all of our um, assembly members from Queens, and then we'll move on to congressional members as well. Um, and we've had quite a few meetings. Not every elected has uh, taken the opportunity to have a personal meeting with Paul and myself, but many have. And um, I think once we finish our first round of meetings, I will go back and follow up with the people that we haven't heard from um, to offer it again and just to let them know what's going on and what you know the center will bring to their constituents. Um, it's also a great opportunity to just remind them of who ACC actually is and everything that we do as an organization for the entire city. Um, we also ask them for things, right? So we need them to cheerlead for us, you know, um, so any opportunity, um, any event that they have coming up in their own communities where they're tabling or putting on fairs or having career fairs, anything like that, we um, ask them to keep us in mind. Um, we also ask them to push out any messaging around hiring for the Queen Center and then also um, foster, foster and adoption opportunities, of course. Um, we never, we never skip the chance to tell them how much we need fosters. So um, that's what's been going on for the past several months. Um, we're eager to move on to the next stage. So once the Queen Center actually opens, I think it's a great opportunity to invite additional stake, uh, stakeholder groups to visit the center and to strengthen those partnerships and relationships. So a lot of small businesses in Ridgewood can't wait to tell them to come to Saturday morning yoga and um, I have this dream for when you know when everything is fully operational we'll do like a Ridgewood Woodward Avenue stroll because just right there on the side street that the shelter is located on um, there are a lot of really cute like mom and pop shops and I think it would be nice a nice way to engage the community and the small business customers by like putting all of these partners on a map and being like come to the center and then you and go to these businesses and get your discount on whatever. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with the uh, committee members on additional things like that. Um, and Paul has been very busy with some additional community events. Um, a lot of things that put our name out there with the residents, um, lots of tabling opportunities. And so from here, I'll hand things over to Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. And Christine, it's a it's a pleasure to work every day with you, and it really is every day because we're in constant communication back and forth. Uh, as Christine said, you know we are meeting with elected officials. I think we have three meetings coming up this next week as well. Uh, so we we are definitely out there getting the word out. So as you can see from this slide, uh, we are uh, in the Queens community, and we're not just in the Queens community. I want to make sure that everyone understands this is in addition to the other four boroughs. So we are out in all four, five boroughs, but this is just the Queen stuff that we've done in terms of getting the word out about the new care center. So we have some events coming up. Our next event, uh, outreach event, in, is in Queens. It's at Cunningham Park uh, on the 28th, which uh, works out really well because there's a big volunteer event that night at City Field. So we're going to be able to you know, do that in tandem. We have uh, other outreach events that are going to be happening in July and August. You know, we're going to be participating in New York City Summer Streets again. It will be the first time we're doing it in Queens. We also are going to be in Manhattan and the Bronx this year. 
uh, doing that. And then we also are participating in the 104th Precinct's uh, National Night Out, which is a, a national, uh, you know, countrywide event that is put on by law enforcement. We were there last year to say, hey, we're coming. Now we're going to be, we're here, um, and we're going to have a great event. But if you see, we also had a bunch of other events we've done, and they've been multifaceted in terms of who the outreach is for, what we're looking at, stuff like that. So we have had events with youth and families. We've had events that were specifically uh, tied around really job uh, fairs. Uh, we've had uh, tandem with our mobile adoption team and, and the fabulous work that they do, that we've had outreach tables there. And we've also you know, uh, done just fun events. So for example, the King Manor Museum, we literally went and painted cats uh, for the day with family members and, and stuff like that. And so it's been really, really uh, important work. We really, I think, though, made our biggest splash in Queens so far was at the St. Pat's for All Parade back in March. Uh, we participated. The organizers said it was the first time that uh, they can remember an animal organization of our scale participating in that. Uh, we had about 30 staff volunteers, we had donors from KECC come out and participate. So we had a really robust uh, turnout for that. We were able to bring our new mob, uh, our new uh, rescue vehicles out, which looked fantastic, uh, in the parade as well. And then, you know, for the first time since the uh, pandemic has ended, we had an in-person volunteer orientation, specifically for the Queens Care Center, which was, you know, very well attended, very well received. Uh, so we're on a really good footing to start that. So that is uh, what our Queen's outreach looks like. We are still in the process of always adding more. So if anyone on the board or the public knows of a place or knows of something that you think would be a good fit for ACC's outreach team to come out and be part of, we will be there. Any questions about Queen's? No questions. Thanks so much, Christine okay. and Paul, for heading up all this outreach. Okay. Yeah, I want to thank Christine and Paul. They really, it's a full time job just in one borough. So uh, thank you so much for that. And also, as Paul acknowledged, we're in every borough. I really always have to thank our staff who do the hard, hard work. Um, it's easy to report on what's going on at the shelters. It's a lot harder to actually do that physical work. And um, I'm just really proud of everybody. And, you know, we do a daily, like, how's the, how's the heat? How is everybody? And before I can even ask the question, I've already gotten a response of, here's our action plan. Here's the new walking pattern for volunteers and for staff and how we're keeping people cool, et cetera. So, um, I'm really always so appreciative of what is happening at our care centers. Okay, so I lost my place. Give me a second. Okay, so let's talk about animal welfare. Um, to start off in terms of our presentation on the operational side, we should really talk about the trends in animal welfare. And we have always used examples or what's actually happening in large shelters across the nation as either models or what can we learn, what are we doing that they're not doing, et cetera. Um, I think those days are over. I think we're all seeing the same thing. The first graph is just national data that's collected from the Pedigree Foundation and Shelter Animals Count. And we're talking dogs. I mean, we know we're in cat season now. And we've talked about that every single board meeting in June. We have 2,000 cats a month, enough to fill Radio City Hall. We're sort of, we don't need to talk about that because we know that. We're seeing this phenomenon with dogs. There are so many dogs that um, are staying in the shelters. So it's either so many are coming in. Um, what we're really seeing is how hard it is to get them out. Um, and Ellen is going to talk a bit about that, but I think it's important to look at the data. It's um, canine euthanasia rates are going up. The red line is the national um, 
trend, and the blue line is ACC. And it's, we started from 2019, goes through 24. And we're, we're keeping pace with um, what is happening. And I think that that is just the reality. Some of the headlines across the nation, um, shelters overcrowded, as animal intakes su surpass adoptions, you know, we're doing robust adoptions, but we have a lot of animals with a, a length of stay that's, you know, several weeks, several months. And again, Ellen will talk about that. Um, in Austin, people talk about Austin as, you know, such a jewel of animal welfare. This headline is they're beyond the crisis point. Um, we know that in LA, they had a lot of um, painful issues where they were overcrowded and there were some really horrible incidents that happened involving dogs and staff and that is something that um, should never happen uh, and again you can see um, some SPCA um, something we've never seen before large dog adoptions down Richmond animal care facing overcrowding crisis admits surge in animal intake so it's not a New York City phenomenon and everything that we do has been informed by what are the other shelters doing? What is happening nationally? Always looking at data, listening to what the public is saying. But I think when you hear um, Ellen's presentation about the day-to-day -day and what our population looks like, I think you have to really listen to what is going on. It's very easy to sit at a computer or not in the shelter on you know a record-breaking heat day and tell us what to do how we should be doing something. I mean, this is, it is, it's tough. We're in a tough place. And what we're doing is what everybody in the nation is doing. We're all in this together. Um, that's not, it's really not a good place to be. We kind of want to say, well, who's doing great? Like, what are you doing, right? But for everything we're looking at, it's just like, just constantly looking at, like, what could we tweak? What could we change? What can we re relax and just keep moving every day, day to day. So with that, I will turn it over to Ellen to talk about our population. Okay. Hi, I'm Ellen Curtis. Um, I'm going to talk about our population. Um, and yes, here I am again. I feel like I was just here. It feels like a year ago I was sitting here talking about the same. Um, unfortunately, things have got worse. When I was sitting here last year telling you how many dogs we had and how hard things were, um, we had less. And I didn't think we could see the new highs that we've seen. Um, I will say before I um, talk more about the challenges we face and the work we do, that I have to recognize my team. Um, because everything I'm talking about, they are involved with and have added so much um, in helping to work on that. And that is Jessica, Director of Placement, John, our Director of Community Services, and Tara, our Director of um, Shelter Operations and Canine Behavior, or on Behavior, sorry. Um, everything today is going to feel very dog focused, so excuse me. Um, cats, as everyone knows, and you can see with these numbers here, um, the numbers remain relatively stable, and it's also very cyclical. Right now, we are overwhelmed with cats. In January, you know, we can adopt every cat out just about. So the, the dogs, really what we've seen from analyzing the numbers, the tipping point was August 2022. That is when we hit 100 dogs at both Brooklyn and Manhattan shelters, and we've never come down from that number for any meaningful length of time. We've tried different things. Um, you know, Corinne knows we've worked with them to um, kind of put out messages that we couldn't take any more dogs at times. And it did lower our numbers, but it never lasted. It would lower them for a short amount of time, and then we'd be right back. Um, and so when I say a new high, um, you know, I thought 150 was the most we could possibly handle. We had 177 dogs in Manhattan last week. Um, if you go to the shelter, you will see crates in every corner, in every office, in rooms that were for cats. There's now crates in there. Um, it, it's a pretty amazing thing. So as you can see from these numbers, um, you know, we really, uh, 2020 was an anomaly. We all know for everything and every part of life it was, um, and particularly with our population, as you can see. 
but I mean now you can see that we've gone to the point where we have pretty much doubled um, the number of dogs that we had back in 21 and 22. Um, so also looking at the numbers and keeping in mind that our capacity for care, our ideal capacity is 93 dogs in Brooklyn and 69 dogs in Manhattan and 22, I believe, in Staten Island. And we are far over that. Um, we're more than double over that in Manhattan right now, um, almost double for the entire organization. And then the length of stay is something that is oops, sorry, almost um, almost shocking. I mean, I remember when we would talk about length of stay, um, Ali, I'm sure you remember this, and we would say that like, oh my gosh, we're at eight days. How can we be at eight days, 10 days, 15 days? And now um, really narrowing it down to the majority of our dogs, which are medium and large dogs, we're at between 24 and 27 days. Um, which is far from ideal for the dogs, for the staff, for everyone. And to add to that, we've had um, we've maintained 90 dogs that have been with us for at least 30 days. Um, um, and so then, uh, Katie Hanson had put together this just a, a snapshot of June just so that you can see what we're taking in daily and keeping in mind that this is cats, dogs, rabbits, guinea pigs. So it's not even including all the other random animals we get. Uh, this is 100, I mean, 809 dogs already this month. We took 12 animals in, um, sorry, 890, yeah. But we took 12 animals in on a day we were closed. Um, we have a high of, I think, 62 was the highest day. Um, and this also does not include owner surrender for euthanasia, which is an extremely important service that we provide to the community. Um, and, and that can be up to you know 10 plus animals a day included in, in addition to this. Um, and when I talk about the others, again, we're talking about, you know, I was in the office the other day, we had turtles, we had ferrets, we had roosters, ducks, chickens. Um, we had two snails. Um, and. And we laugh about it because it is funny, but we literally had a man who was arrested and he had two garden snails. But these snails meant something to him. And we did the intake and we communicated with him and we did the RTO. And as much as it was humorous, it still shows us that like animals, pets mean things to people and it doesn't matter what the pet is. Like, it, you know, he, he came in and got a snail. Um, So some of the things that are making the length of stay um, longer in our, our analysis, um, one is that we're just getting a lot more animals that are coming in as stray instead of owner surrender. And with an owner surrender, you just get so much more information about the animal's history, medically, behaviorally. Uh, there's not any hold on that animal. A stray animal comes in, we know nothing about them. And there's some holds, whether it be the you know 72 hour stray hold, or we're looking for a check, we're doing our lost and found check to see if we can find the owner. Um, sometimes it, you know the dog will come in or the cat will come in as a stray, but it's attached to an owner arrest situation or ends up being a hospitalization situation, and that's a longer stray hold. Um, so that that is a big factor for us in the length of stay. Um, also, we're seeing a lot more animals coming in that are not altered. And um, it's always been, I'm um, oh, sorry, I'm doing this one and not that one. Um, Alex thought she was gonna have technical challenges at my doors. Um, so we went from seeing just over 50% of the animals coming in um, altered in 2019, and now it's 75%. So you think about so many things that we've come here and talked about with like the vet crisis and um, vet techs, et cetera. So having that many more animals that need to be altered before they can or should leave our facility is just an added challenge. So that's definitely something that is adding into that length of stay. So with everything, we have still maintained um, for dogs almost 90% placement rate. Um, 
I pause because it is a good thing in, in a lot of ways. It's not, it's not the best, it's not the end all. And I just think people need to realize like having, maintaining this at the cost that it comes at with the number of animals that we have, the number of animals, the dogs that we have in crates, and we add it to our um, population, our daily population check, the number of dogs in crates just so we can really keep an eye on it because it is not healthy. It's not, a, it's not a, the most humane way to have animals and it's the only choice that we have right now. Um, we are proud of our placement rate. Um, with dogs, you know, we are extremely thankful for our new hope partnerships. As you can see, they are the largest percent of the dog placements. Um, we're also very grateful to the resources that we have um, to help those new hope partners with transport and with spay neuter and with stipends that we give um, and our pre-screener process. We are always looking at ways to elevate what the partners can do for us. Um, I will say, like I half joke that I could also name this slide, um, where are the dog adopters? Because as you can see, that's only 25% of the ways that dogs are leaving ACC. And um, I know that's a national issue and I know we have dogs with challenges and you know, we're open to ideas, we're open seven days a week, we're doing mobile events, we're doing other offsite events, we're offering discounted adoption fees. So, um, you know, any, any ideas that anyone has about how to get more adopters in for the dogs that we have would be really appreciated. I will just make one um, point of reference. We had a mega adoption event in Union Square that was sponsored by the Petco Foundation. Lots of money, advertising, big open space, lots of people, nine dogs were adopted. That's good, but it's not, it's nine dogs. It's like, I mean, it's, it's a sesame seed in an ocean. And we had like 78 cats and kittens. Like, there was cats and kittens, so many people were coming. And it just says something, like is something going on in the city or nationally also, like everyone wants cats now. And um, there were some groups that went back to their locations to get more kittens because they were, they had a litter of puppies. They adopted out one puppy, purebred from the South, I have to add here. Um, and they went back to get more kittens. And you can see that on this next slide because cats, um, that's more than half, more than half of what we do with cats is our adoption. So we have a very um, fruitful adoption program for cats, and um, and we still maintain that uh, cats are euthanized only if there is a medical reason or if there is an owner surrender um, for euthanasia situation. Um, but I, you know, it's not not bad to be a cat at ACC. <laughs> um, so. With that, I just want to talk about some of the work we've done to try to find new ways to get ahead of the problem. Um, and we have spent a lot of time on this, a lot of time kind of analyzing our numbers, um, a lot of time speaking to, to other groups. Um, we talked to ACCT Philly, we looked at um, KC Pet Project, we looked at um, Lifeline um, in Atlanta just to see what they were doing and um, you know other than getting a Miss Peaches adopted, everyone knows that from Lifeline and Dave Portnoy, um, I'm obsessed with that. But um, So what we saw and what we realized is that aside from our at-risk list, we didn't really have a way of showing everyone exactly what was going on, like exactly how many dogs we had. So we have created what we um, refer to as the priority placement dogs. And that is all the dogs that are in the shelter who need um, priority placement, pretty much. I mean, they're not at risk. Um, hopefully they will never be at risk, but that doesn't mean that they don't need to, to get out as soon as possible. So these are, you're looking at dogs who are um, with us for 30 days or over, who are, are what we call level fours, which is, you know, we have levels one through four for behavior, and then it goes to new hope only. Um, we're looking at dogs who are starting to show signs of deterioration, which is really need to get out. So this is a way you can see um, there, it's just a, um, a spreadsheet. 
style. We update it three times a week, and it just kind of goes through um, the dogs, and you can link to their profile, and it tells you, it just in short terms, the reasons why they are on this list. Um, we're just really trying to be a lot more transparent with everything we're doing, and part of that was we have now um, a glossary of terms um, on our website, and we're just um, really trying to put it out there so everyone knows, like, there's, this is what it is, this is what we have. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, we're, we're also just keeping such a close eye on the number of dogs and crates. Um, Sorry, Ellen, when, when did you roll out this new? Yeah, I rolled out the end of May. So that was sent to all the new home partners. Okay. Um, and um, so far, I, I can't say we've had a huge response. I wish I could. But it's, it's only about a month. It's about a month, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, you know, the, the thing is, like everything we talk about, I feel so dreamy. Sorry, but um, the partners are overwhelmed too. So, um, so the other thing we did that we just actually launched yesterday. Um, so the thing that I think is like the hardest for all of us, like when I talk to staff, is um, dogs that come in kind of, for lack of a better word, solid. Like they're doing well. And then they don't acclimate to the shelter environment well and they start to deteriorate and there was a donor who was looking for um, somewhere, somewhere to put an amount of money and what was proposed to her was if you could put some money towards dogs so that we can give a stipend at the moment they show that sign. So I mean right now we have stipends that we give for dogs that are at risk or um, which typically means they have medical, I mean, they have either a medical or more, more likely a behavioral challenge. But to put money behind dogs that don't have that, to get them out before, because looking at the case studies, I looked at a number of animals that our behavior team provided to me, and you can see in the enrichment notes, you see they come in, they're soft, they're wiggly, good walking, and then you see that first note that goes in that shows that first sign of deterioration, and then with each one, you see it get worse because their environment isn't changing. And this is not to say that our staff isn't doing as much as they can. And you know, they're doing the walks, they're doing the in-kennel enrichment, they're doing play groups again. Um, but with that many dogs, it's just impossible to give them as much as they need. So, um, so we launched that yesterday, we sent the email to the partners. Um, I saw a couple of responses that seemed positive, it's just really trying to get get them to take them before there's an issue. Um, and so that would be, we're starting that with $500 per dog. Um, we have two initial donations that total $11,000, so we have enough for 26, but then we also are going to do a couple things. One is, we're gonna call it kind of pay it forward, so every dog that's adopted from the priority placement list, their adoption fee will go into this fund, and then we're also going to just have a fund that is for um, deterioration in dogs, where the public can donate specifically to that. And every time we get enough for a plea, we know that we need at least 500 for a plea. Um, it's not gonna, the new hope partners don't really do much with less than that for dogs. Um, so we're hoping that that's gonna be something that, that helps to get them out quicker. And I mean, it just benefits. It obviously benefits the dog that's getting out, and then it benefits the dogs that are still in the shelter because they'll just have more time um, for staff to focus on them. Yeah. Is there any way we could get that out to the public? Because some people might, if they knew they were really helping the dog get out with the stipend, it would be good to yes. get the money in just to have it dedicated towards that. Yeah, that we're, setting, we're getting it all set up. We're working with Michelle and then Katie and her team will get it all out there. Um, and honestly, like, um, little tongue-in-cheek, but I feel like even people who don't necessarily like us as an organization would donate to this because it's just going directly for the dogs. Like there's nothing, there's no red tape in there, there's no, you know, it's direct. Your donation goes directly to this. So um, I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, and then the other thing that our marketing team put together um, is this map um, because we have so many great fosters, but we never want dogs or cats for that matter to linger in foster. You know, you want them to get in foster and then get seen and get adopted. Um, and so um, this map was created so that people, the public could see if there are animals close to them, um, maybe convenient for them to meet. So that's just kind of another way that we're 
trying to get those animals out that are so I think that's the end of me. That means a lot of us <laughs> Sky, but I think I've heard, and you probably have heard, you can never adopt your way out of an animal overpopulation situation. That's a very sad thing. I mean, now we're being hit with this crisis of overcrowding. Is anybody working towards that? I mean, we always hear talk less spay and neuter, but is there any movement? Because I don't know how we're going to get out of this. Uh, and I know it's not us, it's not New York. Yeah. but. It just seems like the numbers keep going up and up, and the percentage of dogs coming in that are not neutered, they're reproducing. It just seems like I don't know how we're going to get out of it. Anybody working on that? Uh, any, <laughs> well, I think nationally there's a lot of conversation around it. Yeah, I was going to say nationally there is. I think I wouldn't say anyone has an answer yet, but I think what right now we're doing animal welfare is recognizing that it's not just us; it's a human, it's a social based issue, right? Like. If there's people like people are struggling, and so and this is a re direct result of it. Like we don't live in a bubble. Like we're part of, um, like I would say, animal welfare is a social, it's a social service. So I think our biggest thing right now is to work with others who are also trying to navigate this crisis and see how we, and let you know see how we can lend our services for the greater good. For example, housing in New York, 
if anyone, if individuals don't have housing, they have no place to place their pet. So you know, it's it's tricky. I think it's a, it's gonna I think it's gonna be a condition that we all have to adjust and change and wrap our minds around how we view our position in animal welfare. That come to us, or the well, general. the numbers are going up. Yeah. Well, um, actually, it takes some time. for dogs, there are a lot of organizations that bring dogs into New York City. Like in recent reference, I mean, there was one. Really, I'm not going to name any names, but there was a group that had all purebred puppies, and there are a, a rescue group. Like there are shelter and they had all purebred puppies at Petco event. So that's really hard because we asked that same group to take a litter of puppies and they didn't have room. So I mean those you know, we try to ask groups not to bring in as much and I know they're helping in other parts of the country have it, you know, as bad and even much worse in some parts. So it's hard to ask people not to help um, others, but uh, yeah. It's tough. Anyone who brings in an adult pitbull I can't deal with. I just can't. I just can't. Do not ever bring one into New York City. You tell me about it. Um, on the slide, uh, the spay versus neutered status of infant. I'm just trying to reconcile this with the other slides. So there you go. Oh, I'm doing this. There you go. So all right. So it's showing us a portion of the total dogs. That Yes, I think that the difference for us with that is that back then our length of stay was probably more like 10 days. So we were adopting more out back then. And placing more. Yeah. Yes. We, we didn't have the same level of behavior issues back then that we do now. Meaning the dogs that come in are disproportionately having behavior issues with yes. for instance. Yeah, although, you know, I say that, but at the same time, we're also seeing now that we have a lot of dogs that we refer to as level two and three that are sitting. And when I just said we tried to, we had the alarm, um, gorgeous, mastiff mix, um, lovely, absolutely sweetest dog and her 11 puppies. And I know that sounds like a lot, and it is, but back a few years ago, I think Jessica could have placed those dogs in two minutes because they were so nice, they were different, they could probably be adopted for five hundred dollars each. They were already four weeks old. Now it took us a month to get them placed, and we paid groups to take them. So it's just like things are just very different. Can you can you talk for a minute about um, the impact of the shortage, the national shortage of of veterinary care, and what that is having? on the shelter? <laughs> We're gonna add a new a new person to the mix. So yes, there is a huge reduction in the number of veterinarians that are practicing now. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the pandemic and a high degree of burnout. So you see, we see veterinarians who are literally two or three years into their profession leaving the profession. Uh, and so that has a huge impact on the pool of applicants that we, we get, but it's also not just veterinarians, it's veterinary nurses and support staff as well. This is a hugely um, draining profession uh, veterinary technicians, it's actually physically uh, uh, challenging as well. There's a lot of lifting. So the tenure that you get out of a nurse is like 10 years before they're broken. And then the veterinarians now are just moving away from practice. Practice has become, um, I could speak 
uh, candidly with Dr. Coleman, who um, knows what it used to be like, it still is like, to practice in a practice that you own in a community that you're engaged in. Uh, right now, about 95% of the practices are hedge fund owned, corporate owned. They have taken away the soul of veterinary medicine and made it less attractive for people to stay. Um, and so that all decreases the number of practicing vets. ACC has a particular challenge uh, attracting veterinarians because right now corporate medicine uh, will pay a veterinarian about $100,000 more than what ACC can pay. So there is a shift. These people go into corporate medicine. They burn out in corporate medicine because there is a lot of euthanasia. There is a lot of turning away of, of uh, clients who need care because they can't afford it. And then that contributes to the compassion fatigue and the burnout of the vets and lowers the um, number of veterinarians that we can pull from. And then would just to say exactly, and the increased cost of vet care too. The yes. Corporations are driving the price up because there's so few veterinarians. I mean, it's a lot of supply and demand, and also uh, the cost to own a practice here in New York City. The other thing is the corporate practices, you're paid on commission, and the stress on the practitioners, they can't even, some of the corporate practices in my area can't even keep veterinarians in this. Some of the clients uh, that I see say they called up and they didn't have a veterinarian to staff it because of the pressure they get. Conversely, with the corporate practices taking over, I am so busy pe with people trying to f come find an old style privately owned veterinarian, uh, we get clients every day. Luckily I have a new veterinarian who's been in practice 40 years, her building got sold, so she's now come in because she didn't want to go corporate. She was too stubborn. Uh, you get set in your ways. It's pretty much a crisis. Okay, and so to sort of bring it all to a conclusion really goes back to what I said about community and people knowing about us and just like thinking of ways that the community can help us. Um, we've been seeing it for a long time, uh, fostering in particular a dog, but you can do dog, pets. Can you foster rabbits? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dog, pets, rabbits. It's guinea pigs, anything you want, you can foster, even a snail. <laughs> um, it's just going to help us. It would just help us like have some hallway space. And um, we are really just pushing foster orientation, um, trying to onboard as many people as possible. You know, we do an orientation program because like you should kind of know what the deal is, what to expect, and also. We're proud of it. We offer a lot of services to people who say, oh, I'll take a dog for a week and then like not know what to do. Here's the phone number that you call. These are the medications. If you have any questions, etc." So we invest a lot of resources into that relationship. Um, and it is really for anyone who just needs a temporary lift in their spirits, foster program is, a, is really ideal. And um, as we build out our community, um, people get to know us. You can just dip your toe into it and do like a lovely thing for the shelter and also for yourself and your emotional well-being. Also, volunteer program. I mean, this program is just so great. Um, Katie has built a terrific team. Um, they're so active, so engaged. Uh, one of the pictures in that, was that the celebration? Yeah, is that the celebration? Oh, that's an orientation. Okay. Okay. Do you, want, do you want to talk about it? You should be no. so proud. It's so I'm program. so proud. Yeah. Um, so we had an in-person Queen's orientation. That's a picture of that. 
Um, we also had the Volunteer Appreciation Week that you can see on the right um, that we combined with the foster team. We had over 125 people attend. Um, you know, Paul uh, has developed an outreach program, so uh, many of those hours are from his outreach team that he's built up. And then one thing that we did, um, if you can go just to the next slide, this is the first time we've done it this year, Paul actually arranged this also, um, is we gave out Presidential Service Awards, and that came with a medal and a note from President Biden. Um, and you can see, you know, the lifetime levels of some of our <laughs> volunteers is absolutely incredible. Um, Dr. Coleman, your wife, Susan Coleman, got a gold level <laughs> award, so we thank you for that. Um, Deb Kalish, who's right here, um, also got a silver level award because, I mean, that's 500 hours that you're donating of your time to help us. Um, and it was nice to be able to recognize the staff in a, in, in a way that was just a little bit different. So we are really, we're super grateful for all the things that the volunteers do. Yeah, we are um, so proud of our volunteers and the relationships that we're building. And it's important to have people from the community to come in and out. And the opportunity in Queens, before it even opened, we did an orientation. So we feel like word is getting around. And um, when you add up all those hours, it's so much help. It's so much help for us. And we couldn't be more grateful. And then also more about ways to help. You could just publicize this or just get out there. We have um, off-site adoption events, not you know adoptions every day at the care centers, but off-site adoption events in um, almost every borough. They're, they're so much fun. These are photos from past events with the information of upcoming events in Queens, in Brooklyn. Um, we're doing a backyard barks in Manhattan, you know, when the Pet Adoption Center opens, the entrance to the adoptions is on 109th. So it's just adoptions. So no association with anything else, but a really good experience to come in and adopt. And adjacent to that, we have the 109th Street entrance to our backyard. And so we put up um, advertisements on 109th and on social media and come to the backyard area, which we had done years ago. We had turned that urban jungle into a backyard um, where we have medium to large sized dogs running around. It's really a great way to see a dog instead of coming in to the shelter and seeing lots and lots of dogs. And um, we've had, I think, how many have we had? One, two? We've had one, and then we have this one coming up. And very successful. So we're looking like, even it's such a simple idea, let's just go in the backyard and have people walk by. We found, we, we found something. Okay, that could help. That was a successful event. We'll do them um, more frequently. And so we're, we're open to new ideas and we'll try things out. But again, if you could get to the event, know anyone who's thinking of adopting, um, these are other ways for the community to um, engage with us. And with that, that is the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you all, and again, just a, a huge thank you to the whole team, Reese, you and the whole team for all the hard work during a very challenging time as we're seeing national trends uh, just just making everything more challenging and more difficult. So thank you, and again, just to echo what Reese was saying, the importance of, at this time, in our communities, getting people to foster, adopt, help us promote these events will be a huge, huge help. So thank you all uh, in advance for, for your help in making that happen to bring some relief. Um, and now we'll move to public comments. And again, just to remind everyone, two minutes. And it will be a time, and there'll be you'll hear when you're going over. So please. Uh, out of respect to everyone here on the board who wants to hear from you, please limit your time to a focused comment so we don't have to spend time trying to uh, move forward. And also, civility is, is absolutely mandated, and if anyone crosses the border of that, I'll be the referee, we'll have to end the session. Uh, so our first speaker, uh, Nadine Cohen. Please, use, use the mic. Well, hi. Can you hear me? Is that better? It's not on. 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 It's not on.
Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so basically I came to the last board meeting and unfortunately at the end, uh, well, this is not what I want to talk about, so to get that. Uh, why are you not providing little bandanas for the dogs that are being fostered saying, adopt me, foster me? There's a dog in my building right now without that bandana. So that's like, uh, hello. Um, the foster program, I don't think people know. When I did go to an event that the ACC had, people didn't even know what the ACC was. Okay. All right, this is my experience at the ACC. I tried to adopt a small dog. I went to 110th Street. Okay, oh, there's 30 little bulls. No, we have no dogs. We have no small dogs. Only the big dogs. Okay, I went through the big dogs. Okay, I want to adopt this one. He had a toy in his mouth. A toy in his mouth. I went to the girl. No, he's a level four. Can't adopt him. I said, he has a toy in his mouth. I wasn't adopting, I was fostering, actually. Okay, all right, the young lady, the employee that you have gave me her card with her name, her phone number, her email address. Everything was phony. I was never able to call her back to see, <clears throat> did you get any new dogs? I didn't go back. I adopted a dog out of Alabama, a small dog from a rescue. That's where I had to go. Um, regarding the Queen shelter, I sat here and looked up the address on my phone. It's a construction site. There's nothing saying, coming soon, look for us in May, whenever. The public doesn't know this lady that works here at the health department wants to adopt a dog. She lives in Queens. She doesn't know Queens Center is opening. The lady right there I spoke to this morning when I came in. So somehow the public is getting That's the two minutes. What? That's two minutes. Thank you. Gee, you know what to know about that either. Joan, you're um, next. I'm going to talk real quick. you got to promote dog licensing. You're losing money there. I can give you stories when I used to work there, but you got to promote that. They find a dog, they call up the family dog, got injured, they'll start treatment. You're losing money there. You have to promote like you did in the 70s. But my main thing is I'm Queens resident. I'm going to be there 65 years in the same house next year. So I guess I'm damn proud of that. It sounds cute, state of the art, little cutesy. Meanwhile, why do we have less cages in Brooklyn? I would like to know at the next meeting, each one of these state of the art shelters, how many dogs and cats for the house? Because being a Queens resident, an animal rescue person, numbers are important. Because we don't want you to know who we are, this type of thing we get dumped upon. But it sounds like to promote more of the neighborhood, and I'm all for the mom and pops, and all that cutesiness but not the shelter. And that looks really nice, that Queen shelter. But I don't want to say to the yard if I'm going to have less cages at Bronx, Brooklyn. Why do I have less cages at Brooklyn? Who makes these decisions? You, you should let sometimes, let some of us know. Cage space is important because we're dealing with numbers in New York City. Why are all these animals still in country that are not neutered? I know you're, that I got your last book. He got neutered before, but they're still coming. People move into the city, they find out, oh, we went and got a place, we can't have a dog, we gotta give it up. I worked it decades ago. It hasn't changed. Maybe it is like, it is a social thing, it is people's mindset. Puppies are cute, all those people, puppies are cute, but they get to be an adult, and we all know what you got in the shelter are all adult pit bulls. Nobody wants it. I never adopted a puppy. I adopted an adult because I wanted to see what problems I'm going to have with Brooke. And trust me, you broke the child and gave me a problem German Shepherd. But I got him. I got him. He's unique and he's great. I don't know how they saved him, but they did. Uh, anyway, thank you. Just very constructive. Thank you. I find this meeting, I don't know about you guys, it's very constructive. This is, it's, it's hard. It, it hurts. It's, you know, for me, you know what I mean. Yeah, but it's thank very you. So I really appreciate it. I hope you feel the same way, too. Thank, thank you. you. Robin, yeah. did you want to? Yeah, Joan, I just want to address one point that you made, because it's a good point. Um, but to give you some perspective, Brooklyn was never supposed to be closed 
and Queens was supposed to open. So the capacity that we chose was not to replace Brooklyn. It was in addition to Brooklyn, and that is the same for the Bronx. So that number has to do with staffing, budget, and space, but because uh, Brooklyn was supposed to be renovated and open at the same time that Queens was open, and once that shifted, there was no way to make any changes construction. Just for the Queens is a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Kalish. question before I ask it I just want to encourage everyone on the board who has not been at the Manhattan shelter in the last month to please come and experience for yourself the noise the heat the crowding um, the 30 plus uh, pop-up crates in the hallways and, and feel it for yourself it is so stressful. Everyone's doing the best they can, but we're creating our own fe tragic feedback loop based on what you heard about the at-risk and high-priority dogs that are deteriorating at great rate. So that's all I want to say. Please come, because that because your experience will then fuel what you need to do outside. So thank you. My question is simply about the Manhattan Adoption Center. Um, I realize you don't have a date yet. How many animals will be able to be transferred from 326 to the adoption center permanently so that we can start to relieve some of the crowding in Manhattan? Um, so for dogs, uh, we're talking 15? How much? Um, 15. 15. 15 dogs? Yes. Uh, cats, it's going to be a mixed situation because we have that free room where we can fly. Um, so okay. cat-wise, uh, we're probably looking at about 20 or so. How many? I'm sorry. 20 or so. 20 or so. Can you so speak for louder for the cats so we can hear? 20 or so for cats. Uh, that is a mix, though, because depending on how old they are and kittens and all that. Um, Dog-wise, we're talking 15 at the max. 15. If the idea is that it will be moving, like when an animal is adopted and leaves the adoption center, then we'll have staff going over. Right, understood. Yeah. That's the yeah. hope that will be quicker moving. Okay, yeah. thank you. Smaller than I thought, but thank you. That's that Smaller than we hope. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you again, and congratulations on all the volunteer <coughs> hours. And Marilyn Galfin. Oh, uh, yes, hi. Uh, <coughs> I had suggested that perhaps you can do something online or a virtual meeting so more members of the public can speak out. If we're in a crisis situation, I think more members of the public would like to give input. Um, and I also suggest the possibility of maybe something separate from the board meeting to have public input. Um, as we see, we're in a crisis situation, of unprecedented, uh, unprecedented crisis situation. So my question is, why is the city have not come stepped up to the plate? Why have I not seen the mayor intervene? Why have we got already emergency funds? Dogs are sitting there now, as we're speaking, in their cages, deteriorating because there's not enough walkers. This is unacceptable. The fact that an animal comes in healthy into an Manhattan adoption center and gets deathly ill, and then, then it's like, OK, rescues, you take on the burden. The question is, how can the DOH in an emergency situation not be stepping up to the plate? We ask for an emergency overflow space, and we ask for any emergency funding, either it come from the from the mayor's office or whatever. If you ask how we're gonna how we're gonna nip this in the bud, we need some mandatory spay and neuter, which is subsidized by the city. I'm trying to help somebody with feral cat colony. The man is overwhelmed. People are having nervous breakdown. <coughs> we don't have any help from the city. This is a crisis. We need spaces. I'm speaking with people who've lost everything and have no recourse to put their animals in a kill shelter. This is not acceptable. This is New York. There's no reason why we can't have spaces for more beds for victims of homeless people, for victims of domestic violence. There's not enough beds. We are making room for everybody else. We can make room for New Yorkers. We have uh, also, th again, two minutes is not enough time. I had communication going and somehow it stopped. I would like to continue the communication. But I asked the DOH in emergency, why aren't you stepping up to the plate? 
what's going to happen? I asked, are you going to take the Manhattan Adoption Center, maybe rethink it? We need to take any animal right now who's deteriorating and suffering in these shelters and put it in, in the new Manhattan Adoption Center and rethink everything. We have to twist this whole system on its head. And I'd like to be able to figure out how I communicate with the board members. There's no way I'd love an email to continue this. Two minutes is not enough. And I asked, where's the mayor in this? And how are we going to help people keep their pets? I have lots of ideas with many other people. Thank We'd you. We'd love to have the conversation. Thank you. Could you just, uh, just can you give me an email or something to reach me? Uh, the board members, or how do I? I believe we have that email, but we can get it to you after the meeting. Thank you. Um, Joan Kowalski. Sorry, Alex, you wanted to I'm just respond? Really quickly, I think you've, um, and Marilyn had some conversations, and I know um, this I is can longer you speak than a board. I can't hear you. Oh, this is longer than a board conversation. Yes, just to speak exactly. To what's being done by the mayor, I will say that. A lot of what I'm working on is the Mayor's Office of Animal Welfare, and one thing I'm really grateful that we, as New York City, have an Office of Animal Welfare is that we can look at the root causes that lead to this. So this afternoon, for example, I'm going to a tenant protection cabinet meeting, which was recently formed. And this is something that I said, I really think animal welfare should be represented because of the issues with housing. So that's one way that we're looking at the root causes. Um, spay neuter, that access very much on my radar. I think I've had conversations with many people in this room about it. They are continuing. How can we improve this? How can we increase it? Uh, we are constantly looking at that. When it comes to shelters, also very much on my radar. Um, uh, we have a board member <coughs> founded. I hope you don't mind me shouting out. My dog is my home. We're constantly talking about bush sheltering. Very exciting that some of you might have seen in the Bronx, there was recently a pet-friendly homeless shelter, that a pilot that just opened. I was at the ribbon cutting a couple months ago. Uh, URI, Urban Resource Institute, partnered with DHS to do this. Uh, it's, I'm hoping, the beginning of a real trend and momentum. So these are all, the root causes are very much on my radar, on our radar, and we are looking on that. Thank you. There needs more public awareness of all of this. Joan, Joan Kowalski. Yes. Um, I want to know, did you actually put in bids yet for renovating the Brooklyn uh, ACC? Do they actually have bids in for that yet? We do. We do have bids in. And, and we have contractors waiting to start. They are waiting to start. Yes. Okay, because it's very disappointing that the Brooklyn <coughs> shelter is now going to be closed. And now, so we're only still going to have three shelters. And we thought we would at least have four. And it's, it's very, very disappointing. And how long that's going to take, who knows? Look at how long this has taken. And Queens still isn't open. And um, the other thing I want to know is, are, are you open to walk-in adoptions now? Can people walk in, or do they have to put a, go on a wait list still? Or is, is, are you able to just walk in and go around and walk, look and view the animals that are available? Uh, uh, what is the process now? Um, so we are open to people walking in and walking around the shelter. When we reach a certain capacity limit, people do at that point sign up for a wait list. They don't have to stay at the shelter. They can go kind of anywhere nearby. They'll get a text message when it's their turn to come by. Um, and then when we move into Queens, because it's such a large building, um, we're actually going to be using these resources for all of our different programs just so that we can make sure we're keeping track of all of the people who are in the building, whether it's for adoptions, whether they're looking to surrender, or because they just want to see the amazing building we just built and open just to make sure that we're helping everybody as best we can. Because I think that's very important. I think that when people, when it was a more difficult process, I think that helped to accumulate all these animals and, and not move them out more quickly because people got fed up and they didn't feel like waiting and they went other places because I know people that personally did that. Uh, the other thing um, I wanted to say is that, you know, you really should make a budget for marketing. Uh, your marketing person does a wonderful job with what she has available to her, but I really <laughs> think she could accomplish so much more. She's your most important asset, actually. That's how I personally feel. And um, if, you, if she had more to work with, I think that Everyone would know what the ACC was then. Thank you, Jim. Bill Sacre. Sacre, sorry, Bill. Yes, I am uh, from the Shell Reform Action Committee, and uh, Esther Caslow, our president, who is a long standing attendee of these meetings. 
then I'd be here. So she asked me to read a question, and I will do that. In addition to overpopulation, we understand that the Manhattan shelter has faced an additional big problem. Cats that are to be adopted or to be transferred to New Hope Partners wait eight to 10 days to undergo spay or surgery. Unfortunately, eight to 10 days is plenty of time for healthy cats to get sick. Then the surgery is, is further delayed to allow the cats to recover. While these cats await surgery, they take up precious cage space and cause newly admitted cats to be stashed in small cages or in the hallways. It's a messy log jam and may impact the dog population as well. So Esther's question is, does the ACC Manhattan shelter have its full complement of medical staff? Um, and if not, is there a plan to get the small to full staffing? And um, before you answer that, I'd just like to make a comment. Esther, uh, Risa, you are absolutely spot on. The key here is collaboration, it's engagement, it's outreach, and we're seeing specific examples of that taking place. That is the answer. You have to make A, C, and C real. You have to take it out of the abstract. People have to understand what it is and what they can do to help. Not be a keyboard warrior and, and make these outlandish claims that everything is wrong and this is what we need to do to destroy it, but to work together and make it be the best it can be. Yeah, I, I did Esther get Manhattan confused with Brooklyn? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to speak Brooklyn to her. <laughs> is, yeah. Uh, Manhattan is about 85% staffed. We Great. are down a part time veterinarian and a licensed veterinary technician. Most of the log jam there is just based on uh, workload. Uh, and but Brooklyn, on the other hand, uh, has one veterinarian on staff right now, one out on maternity leave, and we just hired uh, somebody yesterday. So Brooklyn is very much struggling. The Brooklyn team is moving to Queens, uh, and uh, when Queens comes aboard, we have a couple of additional staff members that are joining when it's Queens, but not wanting to make the trek to Brooklyn. So we should be in a little bit better place in September in Brooklyn, but we are struggling to keep up, and a, a lot of it <coughs> is, uh, while staffing in Manhattan is a part of it, it's sheer volume. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, John Lynn Friedman. Hi. Um, I just have a couple questions. One is, um, you mentioned that dog licensing fees are um, go into the city's general fund. Uh, so a lot of municipalities typically allocate those funds for spay neuter programs. Is there a reason your city does not? Um, this is the way that the city's funding is set up. The funds from the um, from dog licensing goes to the general fund. There is a um, there. Are, Mary is going to have to help me. There, go ahead. There's a, there is one exception to this. For um, when we sell a license for a non state user, that money goes to the population control fund, um, which is uh, a legal requirement, state legal, and uh, we fund a contract with um, ASPCA to do state. So if you go on their website, you can see, see that. So in other words, some of the dog licensing fees, depending on the dog that's being licensed, do go into a spay neuter fund. Is this just always the way it's been, or was it a change? Uh, this was a change, actually, to, to so include that, spay neuter funding. When was that? That fee originally went to the state. So the state um, kept it, and they were supposed to do spay neuter in the city, which they really weren't. Um, it was sort of a statewide effort. Um, so uh, the law was changed 10 years ago, something like that. And um, so they directed the funds to us to, to provide that program. So that's, but not, it's not 100% of all dog licenses. And my other question is, does the ACC have in-house standard, or does 100% of the standard done by the ASPCA? No, in-house. So you have in-house spay neuter programs? 
not for the public. Are you talking for public? yeah for shelter for shelter animals? animals absolutely. We have yeah, right now I have eight veterinarians, seven veterinarians working for us. So yeah, that is part of their job is spay neuter. We also do subcontract out um, just to increase our capacity. So that ASPCA clearly is one of the leaders. Uh, they do spay neuter for us I believe four days a week, and then. Uh, we have partnerships with other organizations around the city just to, you know, increase the capacity between what we can do internally and what we can do externally. Do you know the percent done in-house versus percent done by ESPCA? Um, I do know that. Can I look sure. it up and get back to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just report it up. Okay, yeah. I'll talk to you about it. Yeah, and uh, I'll just say, I mean, the city sets you all up to fail every single month, and you somehow squeeze water out of a rock and make the impossible possible. So I just have nothing but respect for everything you're doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments, questions. And we, uh, the board, will take a brief recess and then go into executive session which we'll have to take a vote on to do that and and we'll ask everyone who's here who's not part of the executive session to please leave the room uh, as as quickly as you can because uh, we need to clear the room and and again I just want to oh sorry may, may I speak hi hi I I just want to make a couple of comments before you close. I took the foster program with um, ACC, but you lost my paperwork, so I, I was not able to foster. But I wanted to know if there's a problem with dogs and cats not being neutered. If you have a bus that goes to the different neighborhoods that does insight um, spay and neuter um, so that we can be proactive to stop the, the cats and dogs being, if you have a trait as trap and release, spay and release program going on. And um, also, in case of emergency forms, so that if someone passes away or becomes incapacitated in their home, there is somebody slated that's going to take care of the animals or doesn't go to the shelter system, or a card that they have on them if something happens to them when they're out with their dog so that their animal doesn't automatically go to the um, I wanted to know also if you're doing co-housing, as that shows to reduce um, kennel stress in numerous tests. And um, also, is there a possibility to do small over, overflow shelters in the neighborhoods? I would like to volunteer. I live at the exact opposite end of the city. But if there was, let's say, some place in the neighborhood that would take 10 dogs, I would be there every day, and I would be taking care of a few dogs myself just to keep them from developing uh, a kennel stress. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, just remember to sign up and just be a speaker at the next meeting. Um, thank you all for attending, and again, just to, to end on the note that I think you've heard many times throughout our presentation today for the members of the public to get out the word that we need help in fostering adoption. The volunteer work is so important. So please help spread the word, recruit, and thank you all for your interest and thank you for coming and thank you to the board and we'll see you board members in a few moments. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session in a second? All in favor. All right. Thank you.